well, the first video that even got me into competitive Smash was Shine Blind, but I think that's like 70% of the old school people. Um, and you know, that was like in 2003 or four, so that was before YouTube, I don't even know how I found it. And then in the video I saw him wave shying, and I was like, how's he doing that? And I was like searching Smash, and I found Smash boards. And you know, back in the day, you didn't have videos teaching you how to do anything. You had to read a description of a technique and learn the technique and hope you were doing it right. Uh, so Wok was like the first person to make like a really in-depth series on how to play Melee that covered all the advanced techniques and was done in a way that was easy to follow and understand um, with actual like real editing. So that was dope. But then for Bach, um, when it came to meeting people and meeting new players, it was definitely box videos. Because uh, I lived in MBVA, but I didn't really get to go to my first tournament for a year, and then my second tournament was a year later. So I kind of had to live vicariously through the players, through those videos. Box videos were, you know, these little recaps for every event he went to, where it was, it was him and his friends and talking to his friends and asking how they thought about the event, adding some music behind it, and then sending it to like, 300 people on Smashboards who wanted to watch it too. I was going to school for graphic design, so I was video editing and whatnot. So I just threw down a track on the timeline and started dragging and dropping clips. I didn't know who anyone was. I, I didn't know what was a cool combo or anything like that. If you go back and look at those early montages, they were just completely, you know, haphazard and like, I didn't know anything. I told you, Bach, don't do it. We've been friends since seventh grade. I mean, we were all kids together. Not many people have the same friends that they've had since middle school. And I feel very fortunate that we've all stuck together that long. I have fond memories of sitting across the lunch table playing, you know, the original Pokemon with Oru, you know, with the link cable going between the two gray Game Boys. There's some epic battles back in the seventh grade. <laughs> it was uh, MLG DC and uh, Kevin and Chris and uh, Manny were all going to MLGDC and they had been they had gone to a tournament or two before that and uh, they were like why don't you come on down see what see what it is why don't you film it and see see what you think so I went down with them and it was snowing if I recall and I remember like Neo there with his Fantasy Star Online keyboard and he was like kicking people's asses with his giant GameCube controller and uh, we met all of Deadly Alliance down there and that's where we met like you know Kill OR and Dave and Wes and we hung out with them pretty much the whole entire tournament but um, I would just go around with a tripod and I had a three CCD camera um, which was semi-high-end prosumer at the time and uh, I would just set it up and record random matches. I didn't know who anyone was. I didn't know who Ken and Isaiah was. They were there. So we just hung out and had a great time and um, everybody went back to uh, our neighborhood because we all lived pretty close by to each other and we all went into uh, Manny's basement and I brought my computer and I uploaded all the footage I recorded that day everyone was making a big deal that you know nobody had done that before and I was like all right whatever you know so I just uploaded whatever matches and labeled them and I don't remember what we were using we weren't doing like YouTube back then I don't even think YouTube was really that big back then hey, Isaiah. 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 Do you, if you catch any like matches that need to be filmed like need to be filmed just flag me down all right just be like, ah, kill me. Yeah. So 
I had a lot of fun and they were like, hey, we're going to San Francisco next month. And I was like, all right, well, I'll come along. And so I flew out to San Francisco with them and did it all over again. People liked it, so kept doing it. As the community was getting more and more tight knit and you'd see the same people every time you went to an event, you were trying to be like, hey, look how awesome this event was, you know, why don't you come out next time? It was it was like trying to entice people to be like, look, it's not all just playing a video game. It's a lot more than that. The community is a lot more than that. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, you know, going around there filming, um, making a fool of myself, and I would just take, you know, the footage I thought was, you know, decent, and I'd just throw it together on the timeline and time it up with some music and call it a day, you know? If you look at the montages, they were they were less about the matches themselves and more about like the experience of going, like kind of like a travel log of the event. It was, it was just an opportunity to hang out with my friends and, and uh, all the friends that I was meeting along the, along the trail, I guess you could say, because you, know, you were going and you were meeting up with these people every single month. I mean, ultimately, you know, they started seeing me at MLG events, like besides the fan run events, the MLG people were seeing me at every event and seeing what I was doing. And they were eventually like, hey, why don't you keep doing what you're doing, but we'll pay you and fly you out. We were like, you know, the little redheaded stepchildren of MLG, you know, like Halo was everything. And then, you know, oh yeah, there's the Smash Kids. They're over there in the corner. But I wanted to make sure that everyone that would watch the videos could say like, you know, look, look at those kids. Those kids are having a blast. Those kids, you know, are having just as epic, you know, final bouts as the as the Halo kids were. And I mean, I don't know if I was successful in the fact, you know, showing maybe like the final matches and stuff, but I wanted to make sure that at least you were seeing that it wasn't all about the matches, it was more about the people. It's a, it's a really funny thing, because you look at box work and, you know, right nowadays, you know, you look at it, it's like, oh, it's just like home movies, you know, and there's, there's no polish to it. It's just running around with the camera, setting things up on a tripod to shoot the footage um, of the, the gameplay. But there's something really human about that sort of jank. Um, and the more I see that in others' content, the more it kind of verifies an, a level of authenticity where it's, you don't have of a giant production crew behind it. It's just a, a, maybe a guy or two working on this project. And of course it's not gonna to be totally polished, um, but that's what kind of gives it its unique kind of fingerprint. The, the parts where, you know, that, that kind of really inform who you are. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with having a, a really nice, fine, finished product um, with, you know, no, no jank whatsoever, but I don't know. I I I always like the janky players. I like the the janky stuff. I, I I like the the montages that aren't perfect. I like the the stories that like have like a you know an aside or or maybe the audio wasn't perfect or I don't know. It's just there is a a connection in in the same sense that like you know we're we're focused on a, a game with 
you know, that's perfect and crisp and, and everything like that. It's seeing the human elements around it, uh, the, the imperfections uh, that really kind of shine through. I think, what, 2006 was the last big year for me doing videos, maybe, maybe about 2006. So I don't know if anybody knew this, but I'm in the military. And in 2007, I went to Iraq. So basically, I was so out of the scene for that period of time that I was like, well, you know, I went to Iraq for three months. And then I came back and I started working full time at a film studio, working like ridiculous hours. And like, you know, if you've ever been in the film industry, it's like, you know, you should be happy to be working in the film industry. And uh, it was pretty much my entire life was dedicated to work at that time. And when you are really passionate about a hobby and then you start doing it full time to the point where it no longer is a hobby anymore and it's just work, you kind of start to lose your passion, I guess you could say. I mean, I don't want you to feel bad that, you know, Bach started losing his passion for going out and making videos, but when it becomes work and not fun anymore, it's, it's not fun anymore. And I mean, I was, I was working constantly, so I couldn't you know, take off work to go, go to you know, a Smash tournament. I feel like, uh, I feel like I kind of you know, let the community, community down, but I was really hoping that somebody would kind of pick up the mantle. And I mean, there, there have been. Anyway, right, they're gonna get last. They're gonna get last. It's a massive sandwich. Here. Losers finals. I don't even know what's going on. Who the hell is who? Sheik and Mars game. First game. Uh, obviously, it's Mutsu King and Savage versus Dr. PP and Losers. Loser, my boy. It's a unique, special tool, and um, yeah, something that I hope people don't forget that that style uh, is, is still important and always important. Count it again, Mango. Like for, for me, the uh, competitive community wasn't really a thing. Like I, I had been introduced to it uh, just by my brother kind of showing me um, matches and stuff. Uh, specifically, Isaiah versus Ken from Most 3. And that kind of saga is just a great kind of introduction to the concept of, of the competitive scene. Um, but uh, until I saw box like kind of showcasing of a tournament and filming of the players, I didn't really have a concept of what it was actually like to be a part of the community or be at a tournament. Um, so that was kind of revelatory in a way that just watching a match was not going to show you. It wasn't going to give you the whole picture. I know that I, on DC++, I would be looking for dire videos because I play Game Watch, and there's only like four matches of him ever recorded. So like I would just keep watching the same matches over and over and over, trying to like figure out exactly everything he does that I don't do to learn it. Um, nowadays you get new videos of top players every like two weeks in the developing metagame, so you don't really have to uh, obsess over old footage uh, like people used to. But yeah, back in the day, like you only got gameplay, so you didn't know what anybody looked like. I don't think I knew what Dyer looked like, even though I studied his videos, I talked to him on DC++, I asked for advice how to play his game watch. I don't think I knew what he looked like until like 2011. I think that's when we first added each other on Facebook. I was like, oh, that's Dyer? Okay. Um, so that's weird. I still don't know what some of the top players back in the day, like I, I met, I saw Dave, for the first time. I used to watch his Falco all the time. So yeah, it, and then, you know, everyone communicated over Smashboards. So you, you saw that like you, your mind of what, you, what they looked like was their, was their avatar. That's like how you imagined who they were. Whenever you read what they said, you imagined their avatar saying it. Um, and then you meet them like, like this, like, like a really loud kid online with a silly avatar. You meet them and they're like an introvert in person. It's just, like, whoa, that's weird. 
But nowadays, you just know what everybody looks like. And I guess that's how the, the stardom starts, because people at home know so much more about the players and the community members nowadays. That's always interesting. I mean, that's always just, it's sort of like uh, when you meet anybody new that you don't really know about necessarily, that you, you fill in the blanks. Um, you know, it's so funny because I feel like a lot of the people I did meet, the personalities matched with their play. It's like uh, when I met Azen, you know, he's this very reserved guy and like the way he played was like really reserved and very defensive and sort of really, you know, and, and then Ken was very, you know, very energetic and, and sort of, uh, I wouldn't say brash, but he's definitely like, he knows himself, he knows who he is. And when I played him uh, in that little aside we got to have when I was at his house, you know, that was evident. Like he Ken conboed me and it was just, it was, it was perfect. So um, I don't know, it, it, it's, I feel like everybody who plays sort of, their personality is really shows up in their play and, and it gets reinforced when I meet them. <laughs> I have a lot of phone videos from events I go to that I store um, on a hard drive and I really look at them. And like, like at least once a year I go back and I look through it and I just remember something that like, like something funny that happened. Like maybe like, uh, you know, after Apex 2015, the, the, everyone getting kicked out. Like there was a lot of funny moments in the hallways and in the hotel rooms. And at the time, I was completely devoid of sleep, so I forgot about all of it. So just to go back in those videos and just see like a bunch of friends hanging out, even though the event was about to get canceled, I'm like, all right, well, you know, we tried. <laughs> this is fun. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, I know it's um, nostalgia, but there's just something about it that makes you smile. And having access to that in any way, just to be able to to see the um, in between moments. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing to have that. And there's more, like there's different ways to see it. Maybe it's your phone footage, maybe it's a video someone made of the event. Uh, but not not everything is, you know, about, about getting the gold or getting the first place. It's something that we are sort of the first generation to have access to this sort of digital memory that's never going to go away. There will always be, you know, the, the traces of um, your life as a, you know, a top Smash player or even just, you know, uh, tournament attendee, uh, as a TO, as, as you know, you're, you're, you're in these moments, you're, you've been captured in time forever and it's amazing. I, I, I just, I imagine a, a reality where Bach didn't have that desire to uh, record his adventures and um, make it his mission to just get it out there uh, to, for everyone to see, like the, the adventures that he went on and, and that he um, was fortunate enough to be part of. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to be part of that world where, you know, that stuff isn't accessible. I want to be able to go and see that again. I want to go see the Japan trip. I want to, you know, experience that. And I'm sure for a lot of these guys, 10, 15 years from now, they'll look back on these videos and uh, they'll be able to kind of reach something uh, that generations before us weren't able to do. You know, like the tournament matches and the VODs, you know, it tells the story of someone's career in Smash, but all the other content, and all the other footage, uh, it, it tells the story of their lives.
want to go to McDonald's. Just want a hash brown. It's not it's spoken like a, you know, true smasher. He needs his hash browns. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a Samox, I'll tell you that. Definitely wasn't a Samox. That man is talented.